Welcome to our webinar hosted by Quality Assistance. I'm Julie Gia, Corporate Communications Manager at Quality Assistance, and I will be your moderator today. First of all, let's start with some practical points. The talk presented by Dr. Arnaud de Lebel, R&D Director at Quality Assistance, is entitled Hydrogen Deuterium Exchange Mass Spectrometry, a powerful tool for biopharmaceutical characterization. At any time during this 45-minute webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions through the Q&A dialog box of the webinar interface. I will be collecting them and Arnaud will be addressing them at the end of his talk. Let me now present today's speaker. Arnaud de Lobel received his PhD degree in mass spectrometry from the Natural Product Chemistry Institute, ICSN, in France in, tw uh, in 2004. He then further uh, specialized in proteomics uh, during his postdoc in the Mass Spectrometry Center of the University of Liège in Belgium. In 2006, he joined Quality Assistance, and he has held various management positions within the Operational Labs Department and the RD Department, specializing in physical chemical analysis and uh, characterization of biopharmaceuticals. He is since 2016 R&D Director. Today, he will be presenting the HDXMS application for biopharmaceutical characterization. Arnaud, the stage is yours. Thank you, Julie, for this kind introduction, and good afternoon to all the attendees, and good morning to the people who join us from the US. Let's start with the agenda for today. I will first give you a quick presentation of quality assistance, and then I will go on with an introduction on HDXMS, what it is, how it works, and how it can be used in the context of biopharma development. And I will finish with two case studies, an example of comparability study, and an epitope mapping study. So now a few words about quality assistance. Uh, quality assistance is a contract research organization based in the south of Belgium. For more than 30 years, quality assistance has been providing analytical services to the pharma and biopharma industry. And today, more than 180 highly qualified employees work for over 100 worldwide companies in compliance with EMA and FDA regulations. Our main force is to have all the laboratories centralized on one site in Belgium, which facilitates project management. We have a strong expertise on biologics, especially monoclonal antibodies and ADCs. And for these products, as for the other products on which we work, we aim at providing our customers the full range of analytical techniques that are required to put their product on the market. You can find many additional information on our services, as well as scientific literature on our website. So let's move now to HDXMS. So first of all, what is HDX? HDX stands for hydrogen to ion exchange. The principle is actually quite simple. A protein will be exposed to D2O during several seconds to several hours. In the presence of D2O, hydrogen atoms of the protein that are accessible to the solvent will be exchanged for deuterium. So the most accessible atoms will exchange faster, while those that are buried in the 3D structure of the protein or involved in hydrogen bonding will exchange much more slowly. The mass of an hydrogen atom is one Dalton, the one of deuterium is two Dalton, and so for each atom that is exchanged, the mass of the protein will increase by one mass unit. Therefore, hydrogen deuterium exchange can be measured at the mass increase of the protein or the peptide. There are several factors that will affect the exchange rate. First, as I said, the solvent accessibility and the hydrogen bonds, but also the temperature and the pH, as we will see later. So not all hydrogen atoms of a protein will be able to exchange with the same way. Amide hydrogens on the protein backbone, which are shown in red on the sequence, have an exchange rate that is within the range that LCMS will be able to measure, so between seconds and hours. The hydrogen linked to a carbon atom, shown in green, won't exchange at all. And the side chain hydrogens that are shown here in blue will exchange, but at too fast a rate, and during the LCMS analysis, where H2O will be present, 
deutérium will back exchange to hydrogen and they won't be able to be detected by LCMS. So the only exchange that we will be able to measure is the exchange on amide hydrogens of the protein backbone, so the red atoms that you can see on the graph. And the main thing to remember here is that the amount of deuteration on the protein backbone can be directly related to protein structure, conformational change, and protein-protein interactions. So as we saw on the previous slide, two factors that greatly affect the exchange rate are the pH and the temperature. And we will use these to quench the exchange reaction before the LCMS. So after a given reaction time, the pH will be lowered to 2.5 and the temperature at zero degrees. As it can be seen on the graph, the exchange rate is minimal in these conditions. It will also be crucial to limit the exchange rate to, to prevent the back exchange. So these conditions will be maintained during digestion and LCMS analysis because the labeled proteins and peptides are in the presence of H2O and back exchange is therefore possible. HGXMS is not a new technique, but for many years it was not optimized for ease of use, repeatability, and robustness. So here is what an HGXMS system could look like in the old days. It was manual with a poor control of temperature, a poor reproducibility, but also safety risk when you couple this kind of system to online LCMS. The system that we use today at Quality Assistance is fully automated, for example, preparation to data acquisition. The HDX2 system on the left allows an automated sample preparation from incubation with D2O to online pepsin digestion. All the sample preparation is done automatically without any human intervention. The peptides are then separated on an Acuity M-class system and detected with a Xevo G2XS QTOF mass spectrometer, so both from Waters Corporation. We will also see later how the data processing is performed. This system provides a robust solution for HDXMS analysis, and we can therefore trust the results we generate and provide to our customers. So now let's have a detailed look on how the HDXMS workflow works. The first step is to expose the protein to D2O to induce hydrogen deuterium exchange at 25 degrees Celsius and pH 7. This is done by diluting the sample in a buffer prepared with D2O instead of H2O, as this will be detailed in the case studies. At different time points, an aliquot will be withdrawn and the reaction will be stopped by lowering both the temperature and the pH. The LCMS can then be performed at the intact protein level, but in most cases, the protein will be digested into peptides. Few enzymes are able to work at low pH, and that's the reason why pepsin is used, even if its specificity is quite low compared to other common enzymes such as trypsin. The peptides are then separated by reverse phase chromatography and detected by ACQTOF mass spectrometry. And finally, the data are processed, and I will show that in more detail in the next slide. If you now look to the LCMS raw data, here is what you can see. At the different time points, the chromatogram should be the same as the deuteration has no significant impact on the chromatographic separation. But if we have a look to the MS spectrum for a given peptide, so that's what you can see on the right, we can see that the usual isotopic profile that we observe at T0 on the top is shifted to higher masses when the incubation time increases. This is due to the uptake of deuterium that increases the mass of one Dalton for each atom that is exchanged. We get a large envelope due to the heterogeneity of the deuterium uptake for a given peptide. So here is an example of spectra for a peptide at T0 and after one minute, 10 minutes and four hours of exchange reaction. On the spectra on the left, we can see green bars that correspond to the centroid of the distribution and this centroid shifts to the right to higher masses when exchange time increases. This is the M over Z shift of the centroid mass that will be followed to measure the deuterium uptake. The blue arrows show the shift in M over Z due to the deuterium uptake from one tie point to another. These deuterium... Sorry.
these two time updates can be plotted as a function of time, and the plot can be used to compare two states. For example, here the APO and OPO forms of a protein. So the APO form is less structured, and therefore the exchange rate is quicker, as can be seen on the graph. We will now see what is the data processing workflow. So once the data is acquired by MassLinks, it is sent to Protein Links Global Server, PLGS, to identify the peptides at T0, so that means without any deuteration. The list of peptides associated to a retention time is created. This is a critical step, as the list will be used during all the next steps of the process. It is also critical to have a stable separation in terms of retention time, since this retention time will be used in association to the molecular mass to identify the peptides for all the reaction times. The list of peptides is then exported to Dynamics, and Dynamics will determine the deuterium uptake at each time point as described earlier. The uptake will be compared from one time point to another and between samples, and the results will be visualized. So there are different ways to visualize the results that will be generated by an AGXMS experiment. The butterfly plot that you see on the left that will show the two states in mirror, so for each sample, the deuterium uptake is shown for each peptide all along the amino acid sequence from N to C terminus, so from left to right on the graph, and at the different time points, which correspond to the different colors that you can see. However, this view does not allow a good comparison of the results, especially if sample-to-sample -sample differences are quite low. So we can use instead the difference plot that is shown on the right that is well suited to view peptides that differ significantly between samples. The gray bars will represent the difference between the deuterium uptake of the two samples. The longer the gray bar, the larger the difference between the samples. And so it is possible to highlight some zones of the protein for which the difference is quite significant. The heat map that you see on the right uses a color code to show the deuterium uptake difference directly on the sequence. And finally, if the three structure of the protein is available in databases, it is also possible to paste the heat map directly on the structure to visualize which zones of the protein are the most affected. So HDS uh, can be compared to other techniques used for structural analysis of proteins, as shown on this slide. HDXMS uh, can be used at the protein level, so as you can see here on the bottom left, without digestion. So it is much easier to use than the workflow I have described, but the resolution is quite low. It can be compared to ion mobility MS and spectroscopic techniques, or to more complex techniques such as analytical ultracentrifugation and SECMATS. It can also be used at the peptide level, as shown before. It is more complex, but will give answers at the local level, and in that case, it can be compared to covalent labeling or electron microscopy or to a simpler technique such as calorimetry. And finally, if ETD fragmentation is added, the amino acid resolution can be reached and the resolution obtained can be compared with NMR and X-ray diffraction. There are advantages to HDXMS compared to other techniques. First, the sample flexibility. Sample requirements are low compared to other high-resolution techniques. HDXMS is tolerant to impurities and formulants, and proteins can then be observed closer to physiological conditions. The technique is also information-rich. Information can be obtained at both global, regional, and local levels. And most importantly, HDX gives insights on both structure and dynamics of proteins and protein interaction. For biotherapeutics development, many questions can be answered with HDX. I will go quickly through the first applications that are not really in our scope at Quality Assistance. The first one, did my protein fold correctly? So this can be useful during process development, for example. Can I identify sites of protein aggregation? It can be used to engineer proteins to avoid aggregation of the final product. Did the mutation affect protein structure? They can be used in the development of biobetters or for candidate selection during early development. And also, where does the drug interact with the target protein, which is used during early development of small molecule therapeutics? 
So the next applications now are more relevant for us at quality assistance. The first one is uh, do two processes make the same protein? It can be useful for batch to batch consistency, site to site process comparison, also comparison between an innovator and a biosimilar. Are there some conformational changes after a given event? This can be used during formulation development or stability testing. Two samples will be compared to evaluate the impact of an event, a stress, a buffer modification on the structure. And finally, where does my antibody bind with its target? So this is what is called epitope mapping. It has many applications from candidate selection to complex IP questions. And those last two applications will be described in more details in the case study. Even if HGX is now more robust, thanks mainly to its automation, there are still some limitations for its use in a pharma environment. First of all, human intervention during data processing is still quite significant. The operator has to check manually the attributions done by the software, and the list of peptides to check can be very long for large proteins. This manual check is also quite subjective, and we may not obtain the exact same result if the same data set is processed by two different operators. This also means that a double check of the analysis by a second analyst is not feasible nor relevant, as he would have to perform exactly the same manual process without any guarantee that he would reach at the end the same result. As I have shown, the workflow is also complex and many things can potentially go wrong, and moreover, highly skilled analysts are required. And finally, due to the complex workflow, even with automation, a small variability of the results should be expected from one run to another. So as a conclusion, one can forget the use of such a technique in a GMP or GMP-like environment, at least in the next few years, until processing software solutions are significantly improved. But to make sure that the results that are provided to our customers are reliable, we need to find a way to prove that the system works correctly. So, the first check that we did is a check of the SMS system. So, here we manually inject a commercial digest of cytochrome C and we check the identification of all the relevant peptides and the mass accuracy. This check allows us to prove that the LCMS is okay. So, if we have issues in AGX experiments, this part of the system is definitely not responsible. Then, we also need to check the whole system. For this, we analyze the monoclonal antibody, so Azumab, and we perform a full HDX experiment with a 10 minutes incubation. We check the number of peptides that are detected, the sequence coverage, the redundancy, and the consistency of the deuterium uptake. Of course, we do not expect to observe overlapping peptides with significant differences in deuterium uptake, and this is something that we check during this test. On the example shown here, everything worked well, Non-consistent deuterium uptake is, however, observed at the glycosylation site, but this is expected as glycans also have exchangeable hydrogen atoms and induce some viability in the deuterium uptake. So now that we know that the system is up and running, we can start working. And the first case study will be related to comparability and stability studies. So in the term comparability studies, we include different types of studies. So first, batch-to-batch -batch comparisons to highlight potential structural differences between two batches of the same protein. But also comparability studies after a modification of the manufacturing process, as described in ICHQ5E guidance, or when a process is transferred from one site to another, for example. We also uh, include biosimilarity studies, so the structural comparison between the originator and the biosimilar on different batches, and now most regulatory files for biosimilar include AGDXMS studies performed during the analytical similarity studies to compare the higher, the higher order structures of the originator and the biosimilar. And finally, we have also stability studies with the comparison between the reference standard and the stability sample at each time point or the comparison of different stability conditions at the same time point. So in our case, uh, as a case study, we use Adalimab that we stressed by storing it at 60 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. The buffer was exchanged to 10 millimolar sodium phosphate, 100 millimolar sodium chloride, pH 6.8, 
and at a final concentration of 30 micromoles. Incubation in D2O with a 1 to 9 dilution in the same buffer as described before, but with D2O instead of H2O, was performed for 15 seconds, 1 minute, 10 minutes, 1 hour, and 2 hours. And finally, the reaction was quenched in 100 millimolar sodium phosphate, pH 2.3, 400 millimolar TCEP, and 4 molar guanidine. So TCEP is here to reduce the disulfide bridges in the antibody, and guanidine to help denaturate the protein for the reduction and for the digestion with pepsin. So this quench and denaturation and reduction was done by mixing this reaction mixture one-to-one -one with the quenching solution for two minutes at one degree. So here is the sequence that we have in. The sequence is high, close to 100%, with only a few amino acids missing in the inch region that is also the most difficult to digest, that does not have a lot of interesting results for these kind of studies. The mean redundancy is close to 5, so the redundancy is the number of peptides that we observe for a given amino acid, and we have some zones with much higher values. So these results seem correct, and really sufficient to get good structural information. This is for the two samples, stressed sample on the bottom and uh, not unstressed sample on the top. The deuterium uptake for all the peptides all along the sequence. So you can see here on the top uh, graph the heavy chain and the lower graph the light chain, and for the different incubation times. So the uptake is expressed as the relative fractional uptake, which is the uptake normalized by the number of exchangeable protons on the peptide. So as you can see, some zones show very limited uptake, while others show a strong uptake, even if, uh, at low incubation times. However, this view does not allow the detection of small differences between the two samples. So therefore, we prefer to use this view that shows the difference in Daltons between the two states at different time points and the sum differences in gray, which is the sum of the differences of the different time points. We can see that after the stress, the global folding is preserved, which, is conf which confirms that adalimumab is quite stable toward a short heat stress in its formulation buffer. For single incubation times, the colored lines show that there are almost no peptides with difference over one Dalton, as is shown by the red box on the graph. However, some peptides show large sum differences, as shown by the blue box, and you also see a gray box uh, here that contains the N glycosylation type, which is not really relevant in our studies, as the sugars also have exchangeable hydrogens that can affect the hydrogen uh, deuterium exchange. So the question we have now is uh, to know which amino acids are the most impacted by its stress. So for each amino acid, we have determined the mean, the mean of summed uptake across all the overlapped peptides, normalized by the amount of exchangeable hydrogens, according to the formula that you can see on the bottom. And now if we see those results on the graph, you can see the resolution is much increased compared to what was shown previously. And we see some differences I see here in red, strong difference, and some with more limited difference, as you can see here, or no difference at all at some zones of the antibody. These results can also be overlaid with the sequence to give what is called a heat map that highlights the zones that are structurally affected by the stress. We can see that the N-terminus is affected, which can be expected as this zone is more flexible, but also two regions that correspond to the CDR, the complementary determining regions, that are also affected, which could potentially induce some issues as regards the binding of the antibody to its target and consequently with its biological activity. On this slide, you can, show, you can see the results that are overlaid on the 3D structure of the antibody, which gives an even better view of the regions of the protein that show conformational changes upon stress. So you can see the differences on the CDR on this body and the antimus, but also around the glycosylation.
relation site and the C terminus. So with the color code, it's quite easy to see which zones are really affected and which zones could affect potentially the biological activity of the antibody. So as a conclusion to this uh, first case study, it can be clear that HDXMS is a very valuable approach for the comparability studies, including also stability and stress studies, but also for biosimilarity studies. It gives structural information that traditional LC, LCMS, and spectroscopic methods do not detect. And it, it is also possible to bridge these techniques with biological testing, so for example, binding assay or potency assays. So during the stability studies, if you see some differences in binding or potency, you can switch to HDXMS to see if you have some structural changes that could explain these uh, differences in the other tests. So let's move to the application of HDXMS to epitope mapping. This work in collaboration with OSIN Therapeutics, so it's a French clinical stage bio biotechnology company focused on developing and partnering therapies to control the immune system for immuno-oncology and autoimmune diseases. We worked with them on three monoclonal antibodies targeting interleukin-7 receptor, including OZ127, currently in phase one, for the treatment of inflammatory autoimmune diseases. So the question here was quite simple. It was, do all three antibodies target the same epitope on the interleukin receptor? But how can HDX answer this quite simple question? So, if we analyze the receptor without the antibody, all the amino acids of the surface of the receptor could potentially exchange more and more, more or less quickly with deuterium. But when the complex with the antibody is formed, the amino acids in contact uh, with the antibody won't, will no longer be accessible to the solvent and won't exchange or will exchange much more slowly. So the epitope can be mapped by monitoring the regions that display reduced deuterium uptake upon binding with the antibody. So we study the interleukin receptor with or without each of the monoclonal antibodies. The buffer was exchanged to 10 millimolar sodium phosphate, 100 millimolar sodium chloride, pH 6.8, at a final concentration of 22 micromolars of each partner. And the KD of the complex is the, in the nanomolar range, so we are sure that with these concentrations, we are close to 100% of complex formed in our sample that we will analyze by HGXMS. Incubation was performed in D2O, uh, as before, with a 1 to 9 dilution in the same buffer as described uh, before, but with D2O instead of H2O. And this incubation was performed for 30 minutes. So for this particular study, due to the low amount of receptor that was available, we were able to perform only one tie point for the exchange reaction, but as we will see, it was sufficient to get very good results. The reaction was quenched in 100 millimolar sodium phosphate, pH 2.3, 400 millimolar TCP, 4 molar guanidine, by mixing the reaction mixture one to one with the quenching solutions for two minutes at one degree Celsius. The sequence coverage that we obtained for the interleukin receptor is shown here. Uh, we have a sequence coverage that is close to 100% with an average redundancy of 6.4, which means, as I said before, that for each amino acid, as a mean, we have six peptides which include this amino acid. So this redundancy is really good and will allow to get results with a good resolution at the end. Only the C-terminal part of the protein in that case is less well covered. On this slide, we see the differential deuterium uptake for the three antibodies. The blue and orange dotted lines correspond to the antigen alone and to the complex, respectively. And the green solid line uh, that you can see here uh, represents the difference between the two states. Two main zones uh, that you can see with the arrows in green show a significant decrease in deuterium uptake on the three antibodies. Also, although the, mani the magnitude of this effect on the third antibody, so MAB-C, is less pronounced. And these zones could therefore correspond to the epitope 
for this particular antibody on the interleukin-7 receptor. In order to evaluate the statistical significance of what we observed, we decided to take into account both the deuterium uptake difference, but also the standard deviation on the measurements. So we calculated the SSMD, which means strictly standardized mean difference, which is uh, calculated according to the formula shown on the top right of the slide. So we take into account both the difference in deuterium uptake between the receptor and the complex, and also the standard deviation of the measurements that are done both on the interleukin receptor alone and in the complex. Then we use the so-called double flashlight graph, as you can see uh, on the bottom of the slide. On this uh, graph, each peptide is represented by a dot, and on the x-axis we have the magnitude of change, so we have protection on the right, which corresponds to lower deuterium uptake, and deep protection on the left. On the y-axis, we have the effect size expressed as the SSMD as uh, calculated before. And so the higher the value for the SSMD, the stronger and the more significant the effect. On the top right, on the green, uh, green square, we will find the peptides for which the deuterium uptake is difference is both large and statistically significant. If we zoom on the blue, uh, blue square, you can also see a few other peptides for which we can consider on the top right a significant effect upon binding to the antibody. So this graph allows us to prove that we have a difference and that this difference that we observe is significant and could correspond to the epitope. Let's have a look to three of the antigen peptides that we identified as significantly impacted by the binding to the antibody. So in blue on the top, we have the peptides without deuteration, so with a classical isotopic profile. In red, the peptide after 30 minutes of deuteration, when we analyze the antigen alone, with a significant shift in M over Z. And in green, the peptide after 30 minutes of deuteration reaction in the presence of the antibody we see that the shift in M over Z is much less pronounced, which means that these regions of the antigen are in interaction with the antibody and thus less accessible to the solvent. The um, can be overlaid to the 3D structure of the antigen to visualize the zones that correspond to the epitope. The two main zones that we have identified are actually quite close one to another on the structure, which is quite logical for a conformational epitope and gives also more credit to the results. Another adjacent zone is also observed on maps B and C. Moreover, for the first map, we identify another zone that is, uh, that for which the protection is quite significant and which may correspond to a secondary epitope. With the analytical condition we used, uh, however, with a one-to-one -one molar ratio between the antibody and the antigen, it does not allow to easily detect a secondary epitope, but this could be, however, hypothesized based on the results we obtain. So, as a conclusion on this study, it showed that the three antibodies bind to the same epitope on the interleukin receptor, and that one antibody seems to bind a secondary epitope. Interestingly, the results confirmed what, we, what was observed with other techniques by osimmunotherapeutics, including the possible secondary epitope. In this study, HGXMS allowed a fast determination of epitopes in solution, and it should be noted that the complex could not be crystallized and that X-ray diffraction in this case could not have been used. And finally, Ozimino Therapeutics used these results as part of a publication in uh, Nature Communications that you can freely access online uh, using the, the link that is shown at the bottom of the slide. To summarize the, this webinar, here are a few take-home messages. So I hope you are now convinced that HGX is a powerful technique for the structural characterization of biotherapeutics, and especially for the two applications that I have highlighted, comparability studies and epitope mapping. It is a high-resolution technique that will give results in quite a limited amount of time compared to other high-resolution methods. 
and in that sense, it is a good alternative to techniques such as X-ray diffraction or NMR. And finally, this service is now available at quality assistance for our customers. So I will hand up. We now by thanking people involved in this work. Uh, first, Waters Corporation, and more precisely, Aurélien Bolan and Bernard Pochner, who helped us with the implementation of the technology. Nicolas Poirier and Bernard Vanov from OZ Immunotherapeutics for the collaboration on the epitope mapping study. The Région Wallon for funding for this work and Eric, Claire, and Caroline from Quality Assistance. I thank you for your attention, and I think we now have some time to answer your questions. Thank you, Arnaud, for your very clear and interesting presentation, and thank you all for your interest. Several questions were asked during this seminar. We are um, going to answer some of them now. Others will be answered later by email if we do not have enough time to cover everything. So Arnaud, uh, first question is, how do you build your 3D structures? OK, so 3D structures uh, are not accessible by HDXMS, so we need to have 3D structures that are available in databases. So for most uh, proteins, this is the case. So once you have your 3D structure that we, you can access using your database, it's possible to use a script that uses a, a software that is called Python uh, that is used to paste the results that we observe with HGXMS onto the structure. And then it's possible to get the graph that I have shown to you uh, with the 3D structure and the color code with uh, a color that corresponds to a more or less pronounced deuterium uptake on the structure. For the adalimumab, for example, the 3D structure is not available as is on the databases, but we used uh, an IgG structure that is available on the database, in the database, and that uh, shows uh, more than 80% similarity in terms of amino acid sequence with adalimumab. And therefore, we were able to use this structure to show our results that we obtained with Adalimumab. But if the sequence, if the structure is not available on the database, it won't be possible to get this structure that I've shown during the webinar. Thank you. Another question we received is the following. For epitope mapping studies, could you work with only the FAP fragment instead of the whole antibody? Yes, it is feasible and sometimes it's also preferable. So when you perform epitope mapping, you won't have a look to the peptides that come from the antibody. You only have a look to the peptides that correspond to the antigen. But of course, when you digest the complex, you, have, you will have in the mixture the peptides that correspond both to the antibody and to the antigen. So if you remove the FC fragment of the antibody, of course, you will, have, you will have less peptides in the mixture and the data processing will be much easier uh, compared to the antibody alone. So when it's possible, you can use your FRAP fragment. One thing that you should probably make sure is that the removal of the FC fragment does not impact the binding to the antigen. So this can be done, for example, using ELISA or Biacor. And in that case, if you prove that you, don't, you do not get a significant modification uh, in terms of binding affinity, then you can use your FRAP fragment only for the analysis. Okay, thank you, Arnaud. Another question we have is, could you use MSMS to see more precisely on which amino acids the hydrogens are exchanged and then increase the resolution of the results? Um, it can be possible to use MSMS uh, to, to increase the resolution, but you cannot use regular MSMS as we have on our Xevo J2 Access QTOF. If you use regular uh, MSMS, so with CID for collagen-induced dissociation, uh, when you fragment your peptide, the protons uh, can move from one fragment to another. So it's impossible to be sure at the end that if you observe a fragment with a deuterium on it, 
the deuterium was actually present at the beginning that, and that it was not present on, an, on another amino acid. So if you want to use MSMS, you need to use ETD, so for electron transfer dissociation. So with ETD, the fragmentation is much more quicker and you do not have this exchange that is possible. And in that case, it's possible to get uh, more resolution by studying the deuterium uptake at the amino acid level. Uh, we do not have ETD on our MS system, but uh, you can use ETD on systems such as the Synapse from Waters or other uh, systems similar from other vendors that uh, offer the ETD fragmentation mode uh, on their MS uh, spectrometer. Okay, next question is, do you think that in the next future we could have a fully automated process of the MS data? Um, Maybe, but we will need clearly some uh, improvement in the software solutions that are offered at the moment. So the software solutions are very powerful in terms of data processing, but f to detect the peptide, we need any way to have a look manually to all the attributions, because sometimes if the signal to noise is not perfect, uh, you may have some peptides that are attributed to the wrong peak, and therefore the um, it's really needed to have a full uh, manual uh, evaluation of the software at the moment. So I hope that in the future we can have something that is fully automated, but for that we will need probably an improvement in the MS systems to improve the sensitivity, uh, to improve the signal-to-noise ratio, but also in the software solutions uh, to make sure that uh, all the attributions that are done are fully reliable. It's not the case at the moment but I hope that the vendors will be able to provide us with such solutions uh, in the future. But most probably it, will, it won't be in the next couple of years. Thank you, Arnaud. And our last question is, did you try any substitute for sodium phosphate? Uh, not on those, uh, on those studies, but we could use uh, virtually any, um, any buffer uh, that does not interact with the, um, with the hydrogen deuterium exchange. So sodium phosphate is one of these, is one of the most common, but uh, most probably other buffers uh, that do not uh, interfere too much with the hydrogen deuterium exchange reaction uh, could be used uh, without any problem. Thank you, Arnaud. Uh, most of the general questions have now been addressed, so more specific questions will be answered personally by email within the next few days. Once more, we would like to thank you all for your participation. Please note that this webinar will be available on demand within a few days for all participants. Make sure you follow Quality Assistance on LinkedIn and Twitter to stay updated with our latest updates and events. And of course, feel free to contact us for more information. Goodbye, everybody.